Thank you, Dr. Bostwick, and good evening. It's great to be in the College of Business tonight. It is my distinct pleasure to uh, sit in this panel with such uh, experienced leaders. Uh, to my immediate right here is Captain Tim McGuire. Tim is an uh, experienced and career helicopter pilot, leader of thousands. He began his time, he started in New Jersey, and then he began his time as a U.S. Marine officer flying Marine Corps helicopters, transitioned to the Coast Guard, and for the remainder of his career led in the Coast Guard, also flying, uh, attaining senior rank in leadership positions and finishing up here in Pensacola as the Coast Guard's aviation liaison officer. So we're glad to have him and his family in our town. Uh, Admiral, I'll go to you last. I'll introduce uh, Colonel Larry Perino on the far left, your far left. Uh, Colonel Perino, U.S. Army, Special Operations, U.S. Army Ranger, uh, led in Somalia. They made a movie about that a long time ago. Uh, led a, through a career path, leading soldiers, and uh, eventually ended up back in this part of the state as the commander of the 6th Ranger Battalion, which is in a wooded area on the Eglin Range, uh, probably with more bugs and snakes than people. And uh, we're glad to have Larry and, and grateful that the Navy Federal Credit Union uh, kept him near us. So Colonel Perino, welcome tonight. And finally in our center is Rear Admiral Don Quinn. Uh, Rear Admiral Quinn began his path from New York and made his way through the Naval Academy, selecting aviation, and eventually flying from aircraft carriers as a bombardier navigator in the A-6 aircraft. He transitioned to a similar aircraft called the EA-6B in electronic warfare, commanded multiple times in that particular aircraft, and went on to senior command, commanding at sea and in combat, and eventually evaluating at sea in combat with a strike force. He then, in the flag ranks, continued on leading personnel uh, by the hundreds of thousands as a uh, personnel admiral and uh, multiple offices that we have in the U.S. Navy for that. We were lucky enough to have Rear Admiral finish up at the Naval Education and Training Command, which puts 50,000 students through its doors every year in the enlisted training uh, technician and uh, technical skill sets, as well as the officer uh, programs to include OCS and ROTC and others. So to this crowd, uh, it is an honor to sit here in this building on our campus, Go Argos, with these leaders. So with that, uh, gentlemen, welcome. And uh, I'd like to start with a, a first question. In the executive mentor program, we have students who are aspiring to career paths. And so I'll, I'll ask you, and Colonel Perino, I'd like to start with you. Why did you join the military as we, in a student uh, age group, find a career path? And then secondly, why did you stay with the organization? Okay. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, I was a son, of a, a son of a Marine, a World War II Marine. And so uh, being in the military was something that just really interested me growing up. Um, uh, just, you know, at the uh, tail end of the Vietnam War, but I just was always interested in being that. But at the same time, I wanted a, I wanted a degree, uh, and, uh, and I wanted to get my college education at the same time. And so, you know, an opportunity like West Point would come, come up to get selected for gave me kind of the best of both worlds. Not only that, I could be commissioned as an officer. So that actually got me on my path. Not necessarily to go to West Point, but I just really wanted that commission, and I, I just really wanted to be a, be a part of a service. Now, why did I stay? Um, you know, that, that varied. I always, I kind of said to myself, I, I never went for rank. Rank was never important to me. It was always about the job. And rank kind of kind of had to follow along. Form follows fashion, and you had to do that. But uh, I, I would tell you, most of it is, as long as I'm still having fun and enjoy myself, I'll stay. But it kind of changed, to be honest with you, really early on in 1993, um, after coming back from Somalia. Um, very traumatic event. We lost 17 Americans during that time. I lost people that were close to me in my platoons. Um, and one of those things, I kind of, I kept 25 years in. I always thought if I could make it matter, that's what was important to me. I really wanted to make it matter, make my time, make their, their sacrifices to me. This is not, I probably, this is really honest the way I felt. It kind of carried me. And as long as I felt that I can continue to contribute, um, 
and make a positive effort towards that, training soldiers and really just being there for them moving forward. One, and at the end of the day, by when I finally hung up the spurs, I realized that, yeah, I did help them and I still had fun. And so that's kind of what kept me going along, so. Thank you, sir. Captain McGuire, I have to ask the question twice because yeah. you were a Marine officer yeah. and a Coast Guard officer. Yeah. Why did you join? both services, yeah. and then why did you stay? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, first of all, I appreciate being introduced as Captain McGuire. Usually I'm introduced as Leslie's husband. Um, <laughs> Me too. He's right there. So, oh yeah. So why did I join? Well, first of all, similar to Colonel Perino, um, I came from a, a family, my older brother and my dad were both Marines. And, um, my dad did four years, and my brother's three years older than me. So I had their example in front of me. My father was also a police officer, and my mother was a nurse. Neither one of them had a college degree. And they instilled in us growing up that sense of service and the sense of defined a purpose. So I went into the Marine Corps, and uh, I loved my time in the Marine Corps. I made the, the, the greatest friends I, I'm still in touch with today. But at the age of 27, I thought it was time to grow up. And I thought it was time to try to do something else. So for two and a half years, I, uh, I was a commercial aviator for a while. I actually worked for Eastman Kodak. I was a salesman in New York City. I did that for a while. But none of these positions were, were finding a home in me because I was looking for more of a sense of, of uh, I guess, purpose. Uh, the focus was revenue. Um, the people I flew, to give you an idea, to use our aircraft, it was $1,800 an hour, and that's 1987 money. So it was a very, very wealthy clientele. I was pursuing federal law enforcement. I thought that might be the ticket for me. And this is, again, probably around 1988, 89 now. And there was a hiring freeze. So I grabbed a job just to have something to do Thankfully, I stayed in the Marine Reserves, so I did have some source of income. But I grabbed a job driving for Meals on Wheels. And I'll tell you a quick story, and I, and I know we're on the clock here. But at this one location, I would go there to have lunch every day because of one individual. And this is 1988. This man was well into his 90s. He successfully navigated his family through two world wars and the Great Depression. And if you didn't get there 15 minutes prior to lunchtime, you didn't get a seat at his table because he was so full of life and energy. You wanted to be around this man. I noticed one day that there was a gentleman, an elderly gentleman, that sat by himself. And I said to this one woman who danced on vaudeville, by the way, how come that gentleman doesn't join us over here with Mr. Callahan? And she said, oh, you don't know his story. I was like, no. He was a gold medal winner from the 1916 Olympics. He was a millionaire. And he sat alone. He was a bitter, angry old man who thought the world owed him something. Compare and contrast that. Here is a man who who keenly developed the fine art of listening to where you felt like you knew him your whole life. And another individual who, if you looked at his resume, you would say he was an unqualified success, but he had no friends. And I knew I needed to get back to wearing the cloth of the country after meeting Mr. Callahan and seeing this vapid success of this other individual. And quite honestly, the Coast Guard um, took me within two weeks of applying, and I never looked back, and it was fun the whole time. Thank you. <clears throat> Admiral Quinn, as, as I'm about to ask you the same, why did you join and why did you stay in the College of Business? It is easy to look at the leading companies, uh, leading institutions, and want to work for them. You joined at a different time. I would say that we in my time were privileged to join when it was popular and advocated for. So I'm interested in that particular lens for your timeline when you joined, sir. 
Uh, well, I, I would say the decision was made in high school. Um, like Larry went off to the academy, um, I will say it was not as noble or as informed as uh, these two gentlemen. Um, oldest of six kids, uh, my parents hadn't gone through the college thing yet, how you, how you decide, how you interview, where you go. Um, so um, I ripped my, a guy a year ahead of me was recruited for West Point and Annapolis. That's the first time I had heard the word academy. I uh, went home and asked my father, his face kind of lit up. Um, little did I know that that was all about Army and Navy football tickets. Um, and so I applied. And uh, part of the thing of getting into academy is just getting through the process. I got an appointment. Um, but I'd have to tell you that I really didn't know what else I wanted to do. I visited several colleges. The academy appealed to me, so I went. So I went there figuring, well, if I don't like it, I can leave. It's free. Um, after you go through that first year at any academy, as we know, you're not leaving. They're going to have to drag you out of there kicking and screaming. Uh, went through the school, had uh, a great time for the remaining three years there, and, uh, and then chose aviation. Uh, as, as you outlined the, uh, the process, uh, A6s and then EA6Bs, uh, I uh, actually tried to get out of the military four times. I uh, went to the transition assistance program as a lieutenant, as a commander, as a captain, and then they finally got me as an admiral. Uh, I went as a lieutenant. I had had eight, two eight-month cruises, but I worked for a great guy and ended up staying. Uh, one of the big factors was I thought it'd break his heart, which is, by the way, not a great reason to stay. Um, and then I said, if I'm going to stay, I'm going to want to command, and so I worked through that. I got command after I'd had squadron command. Uh, I was on my way out. And again, uh, processing, processing, I actually hired two headhunter companies to uh, find me a job. But then they selected me for the training squadron. While I was there, they selected me for captain and selected me for air wing command. And Murr telling Jane, well, we got to stay for that. And uh, so we went off and did that. 9-11 happened during that tour, so that's another whole story. Um, and then after that was done, uh, they pulled me out of that job early to go to the bureau, un unknowing that, that it actually hurt me career-wise. So I made moves to go work for FedEx and again went to tap class and then picked up flag officer. So, uh, I mean, I, I, the lesson I guess I would share with that is um, keep your options open, don't burn bridges. Uh, you know, you think you know what you want to do, but then opportunities present themselves. But if you've said all along, I'm getting out, I'm getting out, I'm getting out, and then you decide you want to stay, um, sometimes it's hard to take all that stuff back. And I, and I think we've all experienced peers who, uh, who went through that. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I congratulate all three of you for making it through the first question with uh, <laughs> not that many federal and military acronyms that our crowd may not <laughs> understand. So thank you <laughs> for using whole words. Uh, so now I'll challenge you. Um, my next question, especially in this setting, uh, in an executive mentorship program, is as we, we share what we might know at one end of a career path with those starting their career path. I'd like you to share, if you could, a, a memorable leadership challenge, a leadership challenge, uh, and, and perhaps a deployed one or a mid-career view, if you would, please. And uh, Admiral, I'll, I'll let you go on this one, if you would start, please. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where mid-career fits for me after 35 years, but um, one that I thought of when we had talked about doing this question was really my first tour. And uh, I'd had, uh, I think, a job up in uh, admin and doing those sort of things, but ultimately went down to the maintenance department and, and they made me a, a branch officer for about three branches. So really my first time having young enlisted kids work for me. In particular, I had one, a parachute rigger, um, who was down in the brig. He was on three days bread and water. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that punishment, it really tears you down. I mean, uh, staying there in the brig. But he was a uh, hardcore gangbanger. Uh, that's the only way I can describe him. He thought he was tougher than everybody else and smarter than everybody else. But he was really a gifted sailor. Uh, um, the issue is he just fought against authority the whole time. But, you know, his ability. And so we kind of worked through that. After he got out, we kind of um, blazed, you know, what quals he could get, what things he could do and uh, how he could uh, continue on should he choose to do so. And part of that was convincing him that because he had gone to mast and done bread and water that he could still stay, you know, if he kept his nose clean. 
The end of that story comes when I'm an admiral. So uh, I'm over at uh, CNAT, the aviation schoolhouse here, and uh, this old senior chief uh, comes up to me, and uh, uh, the face, I mean, beyond worn, you know, old beyond his years, shakes my hand, and it's that same young kid, uh, P-R-A-N or A-A, uh, Ricky. And so uh, he comes up and says, I bet you don't expect to... I bet you don't know who I am. I said, you're right. And, uh, and then he went and said, I'm that guy that, you know, worked with you uh, on the USS Kitty Hawk. But he was over there uh, mentoring young kids and uh, by all accounts doing a great job with it because he had come up with a totally different path than most of those chief petty officers over there and lived to tell the story. So, uh, so kind of the challenge and then the payoff, but the payoff took at least for me, about 30 years to happen, Irene. Fantastic. <laughs> Captain McGuire, do you have a uh, leadership challenge story for us? Yeah, you know, when, when I was thinking about this story, I could only think back to the first squadron I was in. Again, my, my uh, first tour in the Marine Corps, um, and, and we were in the first uh, H-53 Echo Squadron. So. Everything about it was new. We, we were on, on the microscope all the time. And it was important at that time for our helicopters to be working because it would be a bad sign in so many different ways if our helicopters were not flying. And in those days, the Marine Corps had a special category if a helicopter hadn't flown in 30 days and it was called SPINTAC, Special Interest Aircraft. So there was a lot of pressure on our maintenance officer who was in charge of aircraft being ready to fly and our commanding officer, because if we had an aircraft that went into that status, it had to be reported all the way up to the chain to a flag officer like Admiral Quinn. And certainly no maintenance officer or commanding officer wants that on a record. And this one day, now we're in winter, and the rule states that we can't do maintenance flights after the sun goes down. And the maintenance officer was a man by the name of Major Helland, and I know Bill Cleary remembers him. And he says, Tim, we, well, you and I are gonna get this aircraft up today. I want you to be ready all day because we're gonna do a maintenance flight in order to make this an operational aircraft and get it flight time so it doesn't go into the spin tax status. Well, we had tried numerous times throughout the day, and we just couldn't get it airborne for whatever reason. And now the sun's going down about, in those days, maybe about 4.30-ish, 4.15 in the afternoon. And it's 3 o'clock, and he says, Tim, this is going to be our last try. Let's get down there, and let's get this thing up. So we were walking out to the aircraft, and now it's at about 3.20. And behind us, there's a gunnery sergeant with a young Marine was obviously in some type of distress. And I hear this gunnery sergeant say, hey, Major Helen. So we turn around and his, his shoulders are heaving, this young Marine. He's, he's sobbing. So Major Helen says, Tim, you stay here. And he goes over and he talks to the gunnery sergeant and this young Marine. I see the gunnery sergeant walk away and now it's just Major Helen and this young Marine. And I know the pressure he's on to get this helicopter in the air. I see him put his hand on the shoulder of this young man. Then I see him walk towards me. He looks me in the eye and he says, we're gonna have to do this another day. And I was in the process of saying, but what about Spintac when he cut me off? And he said, Tim, there's some things that are more important. Now, this was not a time of war. This is probably 1985, 1986. But clearly, he saw the value of that Marine, the human being, over the machine. I don't know whatever was the issue of that young man's problem that day, but I know Major Helen solved it, and he built loyalty. People would lie down in traffic for that man. And as, as Bill and I know, he retired as a three-star general in the Marine Corps. So it was a pretty good example to me and all of us that knew Major Helen. 
Thank you. Colonel Perino, a leadership challenge, please. Sure. Um, and actually, it's going to kind of dovetail really nicely with your story. Uh, um, and we're thinking about, just like everybody else, what am I going to talk about? You know, nobody likes anything better more than a war story, so you'll get one. Nobody was here in Somalia because no, no, nothing ruins a good war story worse than a witness. So, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and tell you a story. So, um, it was one of those things. Now, and, and the reason why I'm doing this, and I, I kept in mind, you know, mostly the students here, because, you, you know, for the most part, you're not going to go out here and all of a sudden lead a lead an infantry platoon in combat or, or anything like that. But, but let's go back and put your, I tried to put myself with something that would be valuable to you. So as you start, do you think that when you sh show up in your first job, and you may, be a, you may be even put in your initial job as a supervisor over something, do you think you're going to be the su subject matter expert? No, you're not. And as, and as we all know, as young junior JOs, junior officers, as a lieutenant or young en ensign, believe it or not, you're put in charge of a lot of people and you're not the subject matter expert, and that's okay. So I will, I will take it, I, I'll, I'll kind of take you back real quick to a snapshot in time. It's about six o'clock, and you know, and, um, I, this is not a plug for Mark Bowden's book, but you know, if you wanted to read Black Hawk Down, that's, that's the story that I was kind of involved in. Um, you know, it's about five, six o'clock in the evening. We've got two helicopters down, one of which I didn't know, crash landed. We've got casualties that are stuck in an aircraft. And uh, there's a whole group of us that uh, are, are dug in with a perimeter with that, that are completely surrounded, almost like making it the Alamo, um, over um, a thousand or so Somalis trying to beat down the door. So uh, I've already got one guy that's, that's uh, fatally wounded. He's bleeding out fast, doesn't have, doesn't have much time, Corporal Jamie Smith, but doesn't have much time to live. I've got innumerable folks, you know, so trying to keep, keep story of this, I go, man, I am not the subject matter expert and I can't control what? Okay, I'm not going to cuss. I told you that. Mm -hmm. uh, just sorry, but you know, I'm not going to. I am not going to. What can I do here? I, I I can't control anything. But but I thought to myself, what can you do? Because that's the thing is, what value you got to understand where you do have strengths. Where can you apply your strengths to be able to? Where in there? I'm not the subject matter expert. I'm not the tactical wizard, and I didn't even have control of a lot of different assets to be able to help the folks that worked for me that were stuck out in the street. The one thing you can do is be calm. That was the one thing I can do. The one thing I is, is set the example. If I can't do anything else, I can listen, take down the reports. I can talk to folks uh, as needed on the radio. And it's half of the folks I can't even see. So as I'm pulling reports and, you know, where are you? And I'm trying to piece together and put to, you know, I'm trying to, in my head, trying to put together where, where is everybody around this morass while, while folks are just shooting at me. Morass. He's ready to go. Big words. For the, um, um, and, so this is for afterwards. Yeah. And, and so, you know, how, how, what, 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 what could you contribute? But then I realized, you know, if I panicked, and maybe this is just me, my overinflated sense of self-worth, but uh, I, if I panicked, it's going to be three times as bad for everybody else. And I can't do that. And, and so that was one of the things, you know, find where you, where you do have value. You don't, you don't have to have the answers for everything. You do not. You do not have to be the guy, the person with the answer, because it's going to be out there. But just realize there is something that you can contribute. Just one thing, just always live with this. When you walk into a room, never expect to be the smartest person in there, ever. And that's kind of, so that, that was my challenge. That Thank I, you, sir. That I worked through. This is a military forum, certainly in November, Reflection on Veterans Day. We are also in the College of Business and academia as a, a body of uh, effort makes leaders. Uh, we intend to send great citizens forth to lead in society. And so I'd like you to share some reflections on uh, leading self, which is something we talk about in all organizations, leading yourself, then leading others, and uh, lastly, leading your leaders, a difficult task. And Captain McGuire, if I could start with you. Boy, um, there's a lot there. Uh, leading self. Um, I always tried to, to simplify um, the way my leadership style was. And, I, and no kidding, I reflected back to what I was taught probably in kindergarten 
what was modeled to me by my parents and grandparents. And it's simple. It's the cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Um, none of them come easy. Justice means giving everybody, even the people you don't like, that same respect as any other child of God that exists, regardless of what their difference is from me. Temperance, you know, it's people associate that with alcohol, but there's a lot more to that. How great it would, would it be for, for Chris and I to, to go up to Whiting and take a T6 and fly inverted over your next football game, upside down over your next football game. Um, that's childish. That's not our airplane. We have to temper that ego in us. On your way home today, you might get cut off on I-10. You have two options. Chase the guy down and give him the finger or whatever, or think, wait a minute. Maybe he's on a way to a hospital because he just found out his daughter is, is dying. You have no idea knowing what's going through that stranger's life. That's temperance. Fortitude. Have the courage to do what is right. But it also means have the courage to say no sometimes when you know that's the correct response. And then he say prudence is the mother of all virtues. That's nothing but hard work. That means reading all the books, calling your mentors. It, it was very interesting to see the, the, the leadership of Navy Federal Credit Union saying tonight he still calls his mentor. But prudence doesn't come easy. It's hard work. And, and I, used to, um, I used to read a lot more than I do now, but before I retired, I read a lot of Colin Powell, and he has a tremendous, um, he has 18 leadership traits, and one of them was not attaching your ego to your position. And obviously, we all know people who get caught up, they don't want to admit they're wrong because they would have to say, I'm wrong. And there's countless stories of, of everyone uh, about that type of a person. And then the other thing, and, I, and I've seen this too, is from Harry Truman. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't look to get the credit. So, so just think about that as you pursue your, your business success, and I think you will become successful because that will be the byproduct. Thank you. Admiral, thoughts on leadership as a progression? Well, well first off, I, I'll say that, you know, I talked about whether I get out or stay in, and, and this is really what kept me in the military. Uh, becoming a maintenance officer in a squadron was the long-term retention tool because of the challenge and, and the fun of leadership. Because, you know, after a couple thousand hours in an airplane, you've pretty much done everything you can do in the airplane. Um, there aren't many challenges there, but leadership, people challenges, they're there all the time. This is something I think that the military does pretty well. Um, and one of the reasons why is because we value both the educational and the experiential. Uh, should I need to write that down? Yeah, let's write that down. Uh, <laughs> But, but, you know, uh, we don't let people move on unless they've, you know, done the job in their previous level. Um, I think sometimes, and you read about it in the paper, where people have great degrees and they're viewed as the wonder kid, they move them too fast and they don't have the leadership scars, but yet they're given really big jobs, but they don't have the experience to continue on in that job. So I think in general, the military does this really well. We all, all have our own way, each of the services, but experiential is a big part of it. So on the leading yourself, I mean, it's about, for us, it was becoming the best aviator you could become, becoming the best branch officer you could become. Um, and then on leading others, that's where you learned. Uh, you did the best you could. Tim mentioned some of the characteristics, but uh, you learned when to trust and when to back off. That's not as easy as you think, especially when the pressure's on. I think it's real easy to jump in and micromanage. And, and then in the third category of leading leaders, 
that's where micromanaging is death. Um, you really have to let uh, young leaders, you got to give them what the task and then you got to step back, even though in most cases you can do it better because you've already done it before. Um, but you got to say, here's the task, here's what I want you to do. And in my experience, about 90, 95% of the time, they'll do it better than you think, and in some cases, better than you did. Uh, but that 5 or 10% that fail, you have no better student than a kid who has failed. You know, they're bulletproof, they know everything, and, uh, and then they fail, and you have a real moment there to, uh, to teach. So I think that uh, n not micromanaging, giving people the task, and then let them go do it when you're leading leaders is uh, really critical. And the only other thing I'll add there, the more senior you are, the more true this is, is I never really found a time when uh, it was um, constructive to lose my temper. Um, what I really found, especially as an admiral, is uh, losing my temper just bred fear. And if you want to stifle innovation, um, then create fear. So people know you're going to rip their face off when they try something new and it doesn't work. Guess what? You'll never see anything new again, ever. Um, so uh, I worked really hard uh, to not lose my temper, especially in the presence of everybody. Now, you might hear me close the door and hear stuff flying around the room. Um, but uh, but I, I felt, in, especially in the leader of leaders category, that the micromanagement and losing the temper could really kill uh, any initiative uh, and, and culture that you had been working on. Thank you, sir. Colonel Perino, um, your thoughts? To kind of dovetail off of, of both of you guys, because it, it was phenomenal. I, I already said one of those things, and you know what I said is walk into a room, never expect you're the smartest guy when you set, set foot. And really what I'm talking about, true leadership is that level of humility that you need to have. Ego is going to be the death of you if, if you're not, and that's absolutely right. Um, I do want to touch on one thing when you talk about losing your temper. Uh, one of my senior commanders once told me, he goes, never lose your temper, never yell at anybody. But when you do, you do it for effect. And you do it for effect for a specific cause, not necessarily because you're mad about something. So it's actually a show. You never really lose your temper because, uh, you, you know, for sure, because it's going to have the wrong effect. That's exactly right. I'm not, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I wonder what I talk about leading self, leading others, and leading your peers, which is, by the way, leading your peers is some of the hardest things that you'll ever do. If, and, and when you get into that organization, uh, especially, you know, you sit amongst a room a bunch of folks who think they're important and they're of the same rank or as, as you, and getting them, getting that coalition to move sometimes is a little hard. So that's, that's actually, to be honest, the, the hardest challenge. If you don't believe me, ask about 200 Ranger students right now that are shivering so their teeth are chipping right now out in Eglin right now going on. And that's some of the toughest leadership challenge. But what I would just talk about leading yourself, and I talked about humility and, and leading others, it, it's, it's really simple. I actually, and you can ask Tony Pico who talked to you. He's actually my boss down here. So um, uh, guys, make sure you applaud really loud at the end. So because my evaluation, annual evaluation is coming up soon. Um, but I even said that in my interview because, you know, I, 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 look, I look at leadership kind of boils down to one thing. What do I do? I solve my boss's problems or the team. Or I solve my boss's problems. Pretty simple. But and so what do people that work for me, you know, my team that works for me down there and hardworking folks. And what do they do? They solve my problems. But what do I do? You know, what's my job? And you just think of just try. And it's as simple as I could put it is. You create an atmosphere and you remove the obstacles and you empower those young, those folks that are working for you so they can solve your problems easier. You guys follow what I'm saying? You guys, that's your job. You remove those obstacles and you set that environment where they can excel and solve and you can step back and you focus on the individual as opposed to focus in that. And, and to me, I just kind of, that, that's, that's kind of a thought and that's my guiding principle even today. Thank you. We have just uh, time for a, a, a short comment, and then uh, we're going to open it up for questions. So, Captain McGuire, I'm going to ask just you uh, for some reflections on uh, a fairly hard leadership skill, listening. And uh, industry is littered with the wreckage of bosses who did not listen to the smart foreman on the factory floor. 
or the financier that said, don't do that, and then they were bankrupt. Uh, could you give us some reflections as a leader on listening to those senior experienced troops of yours? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's an incredible virtue to listen, to be able to hear what people are saying. Um, because a lot of times it's not what they're saying. It's what they're modeling in front of you that matters. Um, somebody once told me, you remember, you remember speakers, um, not by what they say, that's 7% of what you remember. What you remember is their body language, their enthusiasm, the way they're speaking to people. Um, uh, listening, you know, is, is I, I think back to the story I opened up with, Mr. Callahan. Um, I, uh, I knew he was a sports fan, and we used to talk about sports. And I was over in New York City, so I got a, a newspaper. It was called The Sporting News. It was 50 cents, and it was two weeks old. And I said, you know, this is something Mr. Callahan will enjoy. I'm going to take it to him the next time I'm stopping there for lunch. So I came in, and I saw him sitting there, and I, I handed him, I said, Mr. Callahan, I got something for you. And I had this piece of paper, this newspaper in my hand, and I reached over to give it to him. He didn't take the paper. He took my hand. He took my wrist, actually. And he said, Tim, thank you for being so kind to me. That's 40-something years ago, that story. I've never forgotten it, because... He was such a good listener. When he spoke, you knew he meant what he said. That newspaper was two weeks old and it was 50 cents and you would have thought I gave him the world. So people understand when you're not paying attention. Think about when you were in a conversation with somebody and they weren't paying attention. That's the behavior to get rid of. If somebody's talking to you and it's important to them, make it important to you and then model that behavior because then they'll know the behavior you want out of them. Thank you, sir. Our last question of the night, I'm going to pose to Rear Admiral Quinn. The military's as a great organization, but there are a lot of great organizations in this country certainly focus themselves in a thought about the whole soldier, the whole airman, the whole sailor. And what they refer to in that is that service member approaches the service perhaps with a family or children or parents. They might be caregivers. They might be the only breadwinner. And so, uh, sir, I'd like to ask for your reflections on approaching an organization as the leader of Naval Personnel Command in Millington in charge of assigning all of us um, and, and seeing through that employee, if you were, and into their um, entire family. And before you answer, I do want to recognize that in the room, Rear Admiral Quinn's wife, Jean, and Captain McGuire's wife, Leslie, were able to make us tonight. And on Veterans Day, thank you to our families that supported us through all these deployments as well. And and Leslie Perino, I am sorry. Okay, so we do have all three. So um, thank you for being here and uh, for all your support. So Admiral, with that, sir, could you reflect a little bit on the military's culture in seeing the entire family? Uh, well, I mean, I think all the services have kind of adopted the, uh, you know, you recruit the sailor, you, you retain the family, you recruit the Marine, you, um, you retain the family, and I think certainly that's true. Uh, I would not have stayed for 35 years if it weren't for that lady up there who was a uh, husband and wife, mother, father, car repair, um, uh, chicken pox, nurse, uh, and, and all the other various things that uh, went on. And, I, and every one of us have similar stories about our spouses, uh, officer or enlisted, so I think I think that's true. You know, it's a fine balance. I don't think, uh, number one, I would say, you know, your people don't necessarily want it easy. They don't necessarily want it hard. I think they want to be part of something special. 
And part of something, you know, part of being something special is that uh, they feel their boss has their back. And again, that doesn't mean that you don't send them out into the rain to fix the airplane or all the various things that we do, or you send them early on deployment. Um, but it's still a consideration before you go off and you do those things. Uh, in the Bureau, one of the things we had to do was kind of put back in the middle the fact that uh, orders are orders. You know, we have a mission to do and you gotta go. But that being said, uh, we tried to the best of our ability to mix, mix the uh, sailor with what they wanted to do and then uh, what the commands wanted, and we got that right about 85% of the time. Um, but in the military, and I would argue in business as well, there's always going to be that balance. But I think the biggest thing is uh, your people will know if you're thinking about them. And if you still got to do it, you still got to do the hard thing, you still got to send them in that detachment, um, they'll understand as long as they know you have their back. So thank you, sir. One man's opinion. And thank you to our panel. We have time for questions. Yes, please. I think Colonel Perino from Navy Federal might have an opinion as a uh, <laughs> large employer veterans. Well, you know, and that's kind of funny you said that because I, I think what a lot where uh, soldiers, sailor, veterans, you know, when folks go into do transition and all the services have uh, call it TAP, call Soldier for Life, they have all these programs to help folks transition from you know boots to the corporate world, boots to suits, or whatever you want to call whatever tagline you want to use. Um, I think the hardest thing is for them, for it's really almost for the soldier, sailor, airman, or whatever, to realize that they do have value. And they you, and they did, you know, okay, if, if you really looked at what my job title was as an infantry officer, you go, well, I could shoot pretty, pretty well, and I could plan an assault on a building actually fairly well. And I could do an airfield seizure, uh, but I work at Navy Federal. <laughs> okay, so where does that translate? There are, there are very tangible skill sets, which you think, at least I hope so, at least I... I, I faked it enough to be able to, you know, to get through through an interview. And those tangible skill sets are problem solving, uh, you know, dependability. You know, but it's hard to say in a resume. I'm dependable, but 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 I go back. To, there are there are there are some tangible skills, or even some I don't call it squish, squishy skills that they that they do have, and they do add value. And they'd be able and learning how to translate that. That is that is that is that is difficult. But um, you know, I look for me. You know, I I, I am not a banker. I work for a banker. I, I'm surrounded by guys that have decades of experience, but I know how to solve big, hairy problems, big, hairy problems, and I'm not afraid to jump jump on them and then learn. And I have great, and I'm just lucky that I, I got I got blessed with a great team that are very talented on skills that I have no idea what they do, but they they make me look actually fairly decent, and I and I appreciate that. And but but it's understanding everybody does have a tangible skill, you know. Um, I, I just kind of, I kind of throw that at you. And that, uh, I, I guess I would offer, if you can engage them with the concept of mission, uh, I think you're golden. I think I don't care what service they came from. Uh, if you can get them to adopt your mission, you know, for the company, for the unit, wherever you are, then I think you've got them. And for the record, uh, NFCU has pretty much take out, taken over outlining feel, uh, Outlying field eight, so I think they're still doing airfield seizures over there. <laughs> I never thought about that. Maybe I should work for facilities management. But yeah, task and purpose is always, when you put it in those kind of contexts, it will always work. And a question from this side of the room. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your service. Um, I, I go back to what Captain McGuire talked about in terms of treating every person, you know, as an individual. But um, in my experience, or frankly, in my practice, um, the more senior you are, the higher the bar is, and the less patience I have. 
So if you're an airman, you're an ensign, you're a second lieutenant, you know, I'm, I'm willing to play along unless you do something illegal. Um, you get to the point where you're a lieutenant commander, you're a commander, you've been around, you know the company's values, you know what the expectations are and you're still not complying, I'm not very patient. Um, one of the things I did uh, for three years up in Millington was all of the misconduct for officers and chief petty officers came to my desk and I determined if they had to show cause, meaning prove that they should stay in the military. And uh, with ensigns and JGs and, you know, petty officers, mid-grade petty officers, if there was no violence or those sort of things, you know, we'll play through, we'll not promote them once, wait a few years, see how it goes, and then uh, if they learned, then we, they move on. But if, if that record comes to me and it's a commander, you know, or a captain, sorry, you know, you've been around long enough, you should know the value. So I think, you know, how long they've been with the company uh, or the organization, how long... They, you know, they've had to learn and adopt the values and the culture of the company. Um, you don't keep everybody. There's some you just got to let go. Um, they, and if you don't, um, everybody around them, they'll become a cancer. Um, everybody else will be doing their job, and uh, that's not good either. So there are some you just have to let go for the good of the organization and everybody else in the organization. Um, well, can I add, add to that? Just because we, we did the prep for it. He, he, he talked about that actually pretty well. You know, I mean, there's no trike, you know, once or twice. It all depends on is, if it, is it illegal, immoral, unethical, and let that go. But at the end of the day, especially as high, and if, if you heard what he said, it, as, as Admiral Quinn talked about, as you rise in the level, you, you're responsible for the overall health of the organization. And, uh, and it was one of the things. And we talked about development of folks and, and go through here. But let me talk about one of the real hard things when you're a leader, and that's firing somebody or discipline. That's really, really hard. But, but I want to talk to you about something like standards. Look, we have the greatest military on the planet, bar none. And I was, I was fortunate to be in some really good units. 75th Ranger Regiment is probably arguably the best infantry fighting force in the, in the world. Yes, for all you Marines, I told you that. That's, <laughs> you know, God created the Rangers so Marines would have someone to look up to. Anyway, so, but, but I, I just, I, I, just I, I kind of throw that out, but... Um, I kind of just chuckle about that. But one of the things that I learned that made it so effective, I mean, yeah, they had a little bit more money, but they had the same uh, opportunities to train, maybe a little bit better than others, but still got initial entry soldiers, you know, first timers enlisted in that organization. What made it so good? Was it the gear that they wore, the fact that they had a lot of Velcro on their organization? Sometimes you get to grow a beard. No. What it was was the... Uh, I would say the, the absolute adherence to a standard and you establish a standard that's that, that, you know, and it starts from the leader on down and then you establish the standards and that's inviolate. That's another one, get that one down. Um, that you can, you don't break them. Everybody's held to the same standards, leaders all the way down. And those, that's what's really important because for the health of your organization, that's what makes good organizations great. And you never accept anything less than that standard. You either build that person up to meet the standard or they, they just need to find something else. They're not bad people necessarily. It's just they just didn't they didn't make they didn't make the standard. They didn't make the cut. I hope that helps. Captain McGuire, as the former Marine officer in the room. <laughs> I didn't say it. I heard you say that. We, we here at the University of West Florida have a mock trial program. So I'd like to offer you a rebuttal. <laughs> no, no. We have, uh, hey, in the Marine Corps, we have tremendous respect for the Rangers. Absolutely. And I have tr tremendous respect for Colonel Perino. So, but, uh, but to, the, to answer the question, um, don't be afraid to play a man down. If you have somebody who's hurting the organization, and the way it was explained to me, the, um, there's a difference between being a discontent and being a malcontent. Everybody bitches, right? Everybody's unhappy at times. But the malcontents are the one that you have to let go. Because like the Admiral said, they're gonna infect and bring the whole unit down. Um, we had, when I was in the, in the squadron, we had an individual, no kidding, who was an instructor of the year at a different location. 
and he wouldn't conform to our culture. And he had two or three different opportunities to change his ways, and he never did. And I removed him. And people ask me the question, why did you do that? This guy was the instructor of the year. He's going to fly so much for you. He's going to get all these X's for you. You know what? There was zero quality to his instruction. And we were standing on the standard of quality, not just completion. So don't be afraid to play a man down if you have to. To that historical note, on wooden ships, cheerfulness was a grade. Now, it wasn't the silly cheerfulness of today. It was, a wooden ship's a pretty horrible place, by the way. So that's where you're starting off. And uh, the last guy you want in charge is a malcontent. So we bring that tradition forward to today. Um, and then uh, a reflection on when do you know as a leader, I would challenge you, your judgment is also on display as the leader because the others are watching you tolerate that individual to some limit. So we have time. Yes, please. We'll start right here. I, I would have tried to have met my wife earlier, I think. <laughs> is, that, is that good? Is that a good answer for you? <laughs> Colonel? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I could top that one because, you know, because uh, we just Leslie's in the room. She's they looking. just call me a copycat, but uh, uh, I'd be honest with you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'll be honest with you, even those things I thought which uh, were not the best of experiences. They all actually want to be either, either learn from them or in the end open a path to something else. Your path is your path and you choose it. And you can't, you can't regret where you're, where you've gone. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know. I haven't spent a whole lot of time because there's nothing I could do about it. Um, but at the end things, I thought, man, that sucked. I really wish that had to happen. And I may have thought that at the time, but at the end, either I learned from it or it actually opened a door to something else that I was more, that, you know, and, and gave me something that I never even expected, which was much better. Uh, you know, I used to speak at the uh, Command Leadership School for uh, squadron and ships, uh, COs, people getting ready to assume command. And somebody asked me this question, and, uh, and I'd have to say that I probably would have uh, dropped my junior officer of liberty habits earlier in my <laughs> career than I did. Um, I Part of uh, being a junior officer in naval aviation is running around with your hair on fire if you're not flying an airplane. Um, and then you're supposed to grow out of that and be grown to a leadership role. I probably hung on to that a little too long. Uh, thankfully, the good Lord watched out over me, and uh, I figured it out during my XO um, executive officer and commanding officer tour. Um, but my uh, liberty routine was still pretty uh, hardball at that point in time. And I, uh, only by the grace of God did I survive it. Um, because I very, very easily could have done something, you know, on Liberty that would not have reflected well on the squadron, on the Navy, uh, or on me. So uh, I was a little slow to learn that lesson. And on behalf of the military families, I would have finished that kitchen remodel before that eight-month deployment. <laughs> <laughs> you too? Yeah, I, uh, although my first answer was true. Um, the, the, the rest of my answer is confidence in one word. I, I wish I knew that my voice would have been heard and, and I could have affected a change in a potentially a more positive way. But I, I, I didn't respect where I was coming from. And, and I wish I understood, and that goes for you all too. You, you know, you graduate with this degree, you have a voice. Don't be afraid to speak up. Um, because maybe you're the one person who's going to start that ball rolling of positive change. That's, that's a great question. Um, 
Well, first of all, you have to have a great platoon sergeant and a great, a great, first of all, you have to understand that uh, if you're senior non-commissioned officers, your, your platoon sergeants and your squad leaders, if they're worth their salt, and I was lucky that they were, they want you to be successful as much as they are, you know, as much as you do. Um, they do, because you know what, in a lot of ways, and especially in today's day, you know, sometimes their lives could depend on it. So it, it, is, it, is, a, it is almost a dual training kind of, of, of a situation where you have to put your trust in them that, that, that you'll make the right decision. Listening, which we talked about, is a huge key, right? Listening to them and understanding and, let, and allow them, one, it's that humility, realizing you're not the smartest person in the world, but you're not afraid, you know, you're not afraid to learn and you're not afraid to admit it. And then, and you know, it takes time. It doesn't gonna happen right away. But they'll get, they'll, you'll get their respect pretty quick and you understand you respect them, but we all have a role in a mission. Everybody has a role in a mission, everybody counts. General Bill Garrison, who is the commander of JC, Joint Special Operations Command, the commander of Task Force Ranger, uh, when that was all said and done and folks were talking, but from different folks, I said, you know, never confuse your proximity on the battlefield with your importance to the mission, <laughs> which means that no matter where you are, realize you have a role to play and that's important. So your platoon sergeant has a role to play, your squad leaders have a role to play, and you as a platoon leader, even though you're the least experienced, you know, you've got some training. You're just not the smartest person in the world. You're smarter than you think. And it's that confidence and ability to listen and to create that bond of trust between your senior and your non-commissioned officers or folks that work for you. And uh, that, that's how you get it done. At least that's how I did. And I'm still lifelong friends with my platoon sergeant to this day. We have time for one more question. First off, uh, not that you guys don't have enough to read, um, but I would uh, commend to you a book called Leadership on the Line. And uh, what's great about that book is you understand why, as a leader, people um, push back because change is hard and humans don't like to change. So you should not be surprised when you're that supervisor. And I don't care if it's, you know, in business or in the military, um, if people try and resist what you're trying to do, especially if heavy change is involved. But that book is fabulous in terms of just understanding the human reality of uh, uh, change and, and doing it. And then, uh, back, and it kind of relates to what his question was on the platoon leader, uh, under, understand and accept that it's not going to happen that first week. It's going to take a while for that, you know, trust to be built. You got to go with what you think is right. You got to listen to the people that are the experts. You got to make decisions and uh, move along. And I think they'll figure it out in terms of how you handle them, how you handle the mission. And uh, and you know this because you grew up, you know, on the Navy side. They know right away if you're a phony. You knew if you're a Devo or whoever was a phony. And the, and your folks, you know, in any job are the same way. And if they know you're real, then, then it'll happen. They'll, they'll gravitate to you. But there's going to be resistance um, because we as humans don't like to change. And that's pretty well documented by a lot of more smarter people than me. I just read their books. Thank you, sir. It is with great humility that we sit before you tonight. It is our privilege to represent those at sea or elsewhere on land tonight in harm's way. And uh, we also keep in mind their families who are at home keeping the home front in one piece. So uh, it is truly with a, a humble spirit that we're here tonight. In the, um, in the executive mentor program, which Dr. Harnett so ably runs, uh, we thank her for even the invitation to be here and on, perhaps on, on behalf of Dr. Bostwick. Uh, and then when we complete, Dr. Bostwick has the last word. Uh, the four of us will meet you in the atrium to continue this conversation. We're not going anywhere. And uh, we are delighted to join your cadre of mentors and are always available through Dr. Harnett. So with that, Dr. Bostwick, thank you, sir. <laughs>